Hi, welcome back to Anything is Possible. My name is Tamara and I live at Lake Chapala in Jalisco, Mexico. Um, this is the second part of my series on dogs in Mexico and I am going to be covering what you can do to help dogs and cats uh, in this area and basically it applies to all areas of the world. Um, I'm sure that you have rescues in your area that you know would welcome your contributions. So I am going to be covering um, at least what I supply in the description box below is all of the organizations in the Lake Chapala area that I could find out about. If you want to find something in your area is um, just put rescues and your city name or your county if you're in the US or Canada and it'll come up with various different links um, either directly to rescue groups or sometimes to a conglomerate page that has a listing and, and the ability to locate the rescues in your area and you can find one that's near you so that you can help. So first off, um, spay neuter is um, a really really huge contribution and usually they are separate groups although sometimes they are included in the general rescue groups um, but I know that there was separate funding for spaying and neutering back when I was in Southern Oregon area so the spay neuter groups and also Sonora California when I moved there um, there were separate groups that raised money for spaying and neutering which were over and above what all the rescues did and the shelters so um, Spaying and neutering to me is like the first line of defense. Um, if we can take care of the, the animals, um, you don't necessarily want to disrupt colonies of cats that are established if they're feral, but you do need to trap them um, in live traps and get them spayed and neutered and then you can release them again. It's called TNR or trap neuter release. That way the colonies um, don't get disrupted. You don't want to necessarily be taking cats out of those cat colonies um, because what happens is other cats will just move in. So you're never really going to get rid of the feral cat problem. I have to say here in Mexico I see a whole lot more dogs than I do cats. Whereas when I lived in Southern Oregon and many other areas, um, cats have been a much bigger issue but here dogs just tend to be running loose and there's an awful lot of street dogs so um, it, whichever it is um, look up your local spay neuter group and if you find street dogs running around um, it's a good idea if you can get a hold of them take them in get them spayed and neutered and in this area and also in Guadalajara there's groups that will spay and neuter for free especially if you're low income but um, I took um, a couple of cats over. They did the spay neuter um, for absolutely for free, although I did give them a good donation because I'm not um, financially strapped and I felt that they, they needed to have some money to support this effort. If you can't adopt, um, I highly encourage you to foster animals, um, either cats or dogs, or whatever you can take in. And it's kind of a good way if you're thinking of adopting but you aren't quite ready to make the commitment. You can foster. It gets, especially with dogs, they're usually, a lot of them get really stressed in the kennels and I appreciate having a break and being able to get into an actual home and get, get some love and where it's quiet and not all the commotion and barking that goes on in a kennel. It's extremely stressful for the dogs. So if you have a yard or a, a home situation where you can have a dog to foster, I highly recommend it that you help out. Um, contact your local shelter and find out if there's any dogs they have that are, are um, experiencing high stress or if the shelter is just simply overloaded. There's an awful lot of shelters 
at this particular moment in time um, that are overloaded um, with cats and with dogs. Um, and I understand that is mostly because of COVID, that during that period of time, spaying and neutering um, was happening at a much lower rate. And so now there tends to be a, kind of an explosion of the population of cats and dogs because spay neuter was not getting done um, as frequently um, as it was uh, in normal times. So now hopefully um, the spay neuter is happening again and we won't have this, but right now there's an awful lot of people um, that are taking pets into the shelters that um, were due to the fact that there was pregnancies happening um, because they couldn't get their dog or cat spayed or neutered or, you know, people weren't able to trap, neuter, and release cats and dogs on the street. I fostered cats for years and uh, mostly kittens, although once in a while there would be a cat that would come in. You know, sometimes an owner dies and, and the cat comes into the shelter and it's so confused and so disoriented. Uh, it, it doesn't know what's happening, it misses its owner, and it just needs a quiet place where it can kind of regroup and, and get out of the stress of the whole situation. And so I had a room set up that was separate from all of my animals. Um, I had a little radio that I would, little um, internet radio that I would play um, with nice soft calming music, and there is calming um, radio stations, etc., that you can play for animals that is extremely soothing to them. Um, and it was kept the light level low because bright light is also highly stressful. And nice, comfortable beds for them, and you know, plenty of food and water, and just quiet, um, low light with a little bit of soft music. I didn't play that all the time either. I left it just quiet a lot of times. One thing I want to say too, if you do that, um, aromatherapy I would not recommend, even though people think that's a wonderful spa experience for people, yes. Essential oils, actually, even though you think they're absolutely wonderful and natural, um, they actually are toxic to animals, both to breathe and to take in. Um, so I would definitely, cats will lick their fur, so if you put anything on their fur, they're going to ingest it. But also just inhaling um, these essential oils can be not good for animals. For four years I was a volunteer at a local shelter um, when I lived in Sonora, California, and once a week I would go and I'd spend an entire morning at the shelter. Um, the shelter often had 18 or 20 dogs, and usually there was somebody else there to help me um, walk and feed and clean the kennels, scrub them down, um, and do any medications they needed doing. But there were a few times when I was there by myself, and that was a real workout. So if you want to get some exercise and fresh air, I would suggest, hey, uh, volunteer at your local shelter, walk the dogs. That You know, a dog can never be walked too much. Um, so we walked the dogs at least twice a day, and if there were volunteers that would show up midday, it was just that much better. The dogs loved it, and we had play yards where they could play, and um, you had to be there to supervise, so there was always a need to be volunteers for that. It was a really rewarding experience. It was really fun, and we always eagerly looked forward to showing up. We did Sunday mornings, me and my partner, and we would go, and it was always kind of fun to go and see who was there that week, because, you know, there was usually some dogs got adopted and we would just have a little celebration for them and then there would be some new faces and we'd get to know some of the new dogs and we actually adopted one dog that way because he just lingered and lingered in there and he was the most wonderful dog and we would take him out on field trips and hikes and stuff with us and we were constantly asking people on the trail if they were looking for a dog if they wanted to adopt him and 
Oh, there was more no takers for this one dog and we just loved him so much so we ended up adopting him so fostering or even uh, working at a shelter volunteering is a great way um, just to see if you can fall in love with an animal and you really connect um, it's really hard to walk in and just grab an animal and know for sure if that's going to be somebody you want for the rest of their life um, so uh, we, we were able to hand pick the ones that we got, and I've, I've almost always gotten shelter animals. At least locally here at Lake Chapala, there is a pet food bank um, because there is actually a lot of low-income people here, and it's hard for them to even have the money to feed their animals a lot of times. So um, the pet food bank, um, you can either just donate or, or give food, um, and they give give food to the local families that have pets that are having a hard time keeping their animal fed. Transportation groups are also available here. Um, there's both ones that will fly animals. Um, there's shelters up north um, that do take animals at certain times of the year. They've been really wonderful in large metropolitan areas. Um, that are not overloaded right now with animals and they're able to take some of our pets from here in Mexico. There's um, a flight group and there's also bus buses that drive north with the dogs so the dogs can find homes up north. It's really hard to find enough homes here locally. You can donate to those groups. Um, and also when I lived in the Southern Oregon area, there was a number of groups, and in fact there are a national group in the United States that arranges for, they, they do like a relay, you'll drive a leg of a trip when they're trying to get, say somebody finds a dog that they fall in love with on Pet Finder, um, they will adopt the dog from the shelter, but then you have to get the dog from that place to another place, or cat, or in fact I've even transported a tortoise once. <laughs> and it was going to a home in Arizona. Look up and see if there's a transport group. It's kind of a fun way I always found, especially during COVID, it was great. Uh, you could get out of the house and it didn't involve a lot of social interaction. Um, and you can take a leg of a trip that's local to you. Either I would drive from a town that was south of me I would drive south, pick up the dog, and drive back north, or I would drive north, pick up the dog, and drive south, depending on which direction the um, transport was going. But um, you can be part of helping to save another life that way. Um, I have not seen any relays here in Mexico for that. Um, most of the dogs and cats that we transport here are all going up to the United States. So they're either being flown or bussed on these large transports that um, happen. But also, <laughs> there is a way that you can be a part of helping an animal. If you are planning a trip to the United States, um, you can contact your local shelters and see if there's any animals that need transporting to the location where you're going. So if you're flying from Guadalajara, to Seattle or Chicago or any place. Um, you can be what is called a flight angel for an animal. So if they're trying to get an animal transported to a particular city, you can say, contact them and tell them where you're going. And basically what you do is you take the responsibility for that pet, you check it at the airport. Um, I was reading through Volaris um, website and there's, you know, you have to have paperwork um, and the dog has to be up on vaccines. Basically you just sort of take that animal under your wing and check it like baggage basically and have the paperwork and then when you get to your destination there will be someone there to pick the animal up and you just hand over the pet and the and the the paperwork, so you can be uh, a link in that and getting that dog usually um, to its destination wherever it is that it's it's going. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're traveling. You can contact local shelters and see if they have anyone 
um, who needs to be transported to your destination and you can be part of the solution there by being a flight angel for an animal in your local shelter. Finally, I would like to say that, of course, if you can't do any of these things, um, of course, adopt, you know, please don't buy from a breeder. There are so many wonderful animals looking for homes that, um, you know, have even been sitting in the shelters for a long time, or if they're in a shelter that's a high kill shelter, their days are numbered. And there are thousands of animals that have to be put down all the time. Um, because nobody adopts them and they're perfectly wonderful adoptable animals. So please adopt, don't shop. So donate. Um, they're always, always needing money for, it takes a lot of money to take care of these animals, especially when they come in with injuries or health conditions that need treatment. Of course they go through lots of food, they have to do spay neutering, they have to do um, vaccinations and deworming and of course there's behavioral issues so training and often grooming um, really helps animals get adopted quicker so um, money is always welcome um, even over and above if you do other ways of volunteering um, it would be wonderful if you could donate maybe just set aside a little bit each month and donate to any one of these organizations. Now on that note also I have to say that uh, people have found found me um, since the shelters here tend to be so overcrowded and overloaded. A couple of local people um, I know of they take in street animals, cats and dogs, and they're often in really bad shape. They have injuries, they've been abused, um, hit by cars um, and, and they need a hand and these wonderful people um, take animals into their home and they get them treated and then they're available for adoption and so these private individuals actually adopt animals out also you probably see them on Facebook groups or whatever um, offering animals um, that have recovered but these private individuals have no funding. So they reach out and when they find someone that's able to donate, um, that is what they do. And I have been found by a couple of these wonderful individuals. One's in Machu Michoacan and one is in uh, Talakipaki. And they both take in animals and especially injured animals. and give them a place to stay, a safe haven, and get them treated. And it takes money. And so I have found them to be extremely grateful. It is not a tax write-off. Um, I, I have kind of given up on that. Um, you know, there's so much need. And I think somebody somewhere is tallying up the thing, good things I've done. Um, and it isn't always in the form of a tax write-off. Um, sometimes it's in the form of just karma, good karma. You know, you've done something to help these animals that need help so badly. And these like, people that take them in, those will probably just find you. Um, if you join some Facebook groups of local shelters and organizations and um, get involved in the local animal community, um, these people will probably find you and you'll probably have to vet them for yourself and make sure that they're bona fide and they're really doing what they're doing. Um, you can always ask for photographs of the animal um, and its injuries and you know it's always good to see the before and after um, and they don't all make it sadly. Um, sometimes an animal is so badly injured it can't be saved or or so sick, um, you have to be prepared for that mentally, but um, at least these people are out there helping um, over and above what the actual bona fide organizations are. You know, there's people out there that are doing the best they can for the animals when there is no shelter that can take them.
I've linked to a, one website that has links to a whole lot of different types of organizations um, and a way that you can go to their website, find out more about them, and also just a donate button. And also there's a couple of websites that aren't on that or that the I found that the link didn't work on that website. So I've, I've added a list of all of those for uh, the Lake Chapala area, including Ishwatla Khan. Um, there isn't anything specifically that I could find in Hokotepec, um, but they do do spay-neuter there, uh, I guess um, twice a month, maybe once a month, I'm not sure, and also a vaccination clinic there. So if you get in personally involved, you can actually help with this clinic that they have, especially if you're bilingual. It would be extremely helpful. This is the end of the series on the dogs of Mexico, and it involved a little bit of cats here too, because I have a real soft spot for cats. But um, I just thought I'd put this out here because it is a real, just an ever-present problem in Mexico. And it's a, it's a problem everywhere, but it seems like there's an awful lot of street dogs here. And um, the more people that know about it, and know something, I mean any of those things, will be of a great help. Um, so thank you so much for watching. I hope you can do something to help our little animal friends. And I will see you next time. Bye.